150 years ago, this book was published. It would become one of the greatest children's stories ever. And it all began here. One summer's day, the Reverend Charles Dodgson took 10-year-old Alice Little and her sisters on a boat trip along the River Thames. The girls were absolutely enchanted by his stories and the power of Carol's imagination has enthralled millions of readers from John Lennon to James Joyce. Alice, hands down for me, is number one, always has been. It's absolutely a magical ride. In terms of children's literature, a, a revolutionary book. And it's unlike, of course, anything that had ever been written for children before. The book is fantastic and brilliant. I would give it five stars. It's good. They say that after the Bible and Shakespeare, Lewis Carroll is the most potent author on earth. These are the foreign language editions of Alice we have aboriginally here, French, German, Japanese. Only a handful of people would have known at the time that Charles Dodson, a maths don at Christchurch, Oxford, was also Lewis Carroll. And that the inspiration for the book was a real Alice, Alice Little, the Dean's daughter. For years, the relationship between Carroll and Alice Little has been the subject of speculation. I think he was in love with her, but I don't think he would have admitted that to himself. Carol's reputation has also been dogged by questions about his child friends and the photographs he took of them. That is quite disturbing, it actually, is, isn't and it? That's a little girl in a very adult pose. And in the course of our research, we've uncovered new material that adds to this controversy. My gut instinct is it's by Lewis Carroll. What was really going on? Who knows? So what was it that led to the creation of Carol's masterpiece, Alice's Adventures in Wonderland? And what are we to make of the controversies surrounding him? You probably recognise Christchurch as the dining hall at Hogwarts. And in fact, Lewis Carroll, who taught here, created the Harry Potter of his day. So how did this rather dry mathematics lecturer manage to create such a fantastical world? And what was the nature of his relationship with the real Alice? It's Alice Day in Oxford. Every 4th of July, they celebrate the day in 1862 when Lewis Carroll told Alice and her sisters the story of Alice in Wonderland. I'm clearly Alice. <laughs> and I'm the Mad Hatter. Mad Hatter, March Hare and Alice. Everyone in here like Alice. Alice. Yes. yes. We all know the story, don't we? Alice was getting very tired of sitting by her sister on a riverbank when suddenly a white rabbit with pink eyes ran close by her. Either she falls asleep or she follows a white rabbit who leads her down a hole. It's ambiguous. She finds herself in an underground chamber. Um, with a tiny little door. And the key was on the table and she couldn't reach it. She sees a bottle with the words drink me on it. And she goes through all sorts of nasty experiences. That's when she met the Cheshire cat. Alice go to a tea party. Tea party. Yes, yes. She meets this strange character. <laughs> That'd be me. <laughs> um, who's a bit deluded. Alice um, got a bit stressed because they were being so mad. Then there is a weird game of croquet. The cards were like painting the roses red. And eventually Alice loses her temper. And she comes out at the end saying you're nothing but a pack of cards. Oh, well, don't ask me about Alice in Wonderland. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just here for the fun. <laughs> I love this book. I always have. I was just captivated by Lewis Carroll's completely surreal imagination and transported off to Wonderland. I even played Alice when I was a young girl in the village play. This is where I grew up, Ditchling in Sussex. When I was 11, the village put on a version of Alice Through the Looking Glass. And I'm on my way back for a reunion. Oh, I, 
there's actually a recording of the production over here. This is Ditchling Player's performance of Alice Through the Looking Glass, January 1969. Across the field, things for next board. Well, here I am. I'm getting very tired. Where is Humpty Dumpty? He's here! <laughs> I'm not sure I like listening to my own voice back nowadays, let alone when I was 11. <laughs> it feels very... But what is, what is really charming is hearing the audience laughing. Yeah. And yes. really, you know, enjoying and it. Oh, the, yes, they certainly loved it. I had no idea I was acting in such a psychedelic production. No. <laughs> Alice broke box office records. In Ditchling. <laughs> <laughs> there was a, a general praise for ten-year-old Martha Carney, who plays Alice. This was a performance that will be remembered in Ditchling for some time. <laughs> and this was, yes, this was the one that was used a lot, wasn't it? Yes. Playing the, That's why it's a the game of chess. Card, Very much kind of Lewis Carroll's amazing imagination to have a game as the, the centre of it all. Yes. He yeah. does that in Alice's Adventures in Wonderland as well. There's playing cards there. Yes. He loved that idea of playing games. I'm 57 and I first read the book when I was seven years old and I have read it every year at least once since then. So I've read it a minimum 50 times. It's possible that my character Lyra is a sort of descendant of Alice in that she's a matter-of-fact child in a world of large and strange things she doesn't fully understand. So probably I stole that, yes. Yeah. So why has this book captivated children and adults, actually, for 150 years? Alice in Wonderland endures because it is universal literature. It captures brilliantly how a child responds to the world at a time when some of the categories that unfortunately we start to take for granted when we're a bit older are yet fluid. So the barriers between dream and reality, all of these remain porous in Alice and he grasps beautifully what, what the psychology of that situation is like. It was in the corner of this famous quad at Christchurch, right over there, that Lewis Carroll wrote down his story, Alice in Wonderland. It's now actually an internet cafe for students. And over here was where Alice Liddell lived. She was the Dean's daughter and the inspiration for the book. Little did Alice know that the story would come to dominate her life. In 1932, as an old lady, she visited New York, where she was captured on film for the first time. It is a, a great honour and a great pleasure to have come over here. And I think now my adventures overseas will be almost as interesting as my adventures underground were. So how did those adventures come to be created? It really began here in Oxford when Lewis Carroll first met Alice Little. She was around four at the time. He was 24, a newly qualified maths don. It was a relationship which seems unusual, to say the least, to modernise. He was dry, a methodical, a punctilious. Alice Little said that he looked as if um, he had a poker stuck up him. He was, you know, so upright. Everything was you know, neat, fixed, orderly. I mean, it's hard not to think of him as someone who had a mild form of OCD. In those days, dons at Christchurch had to take holy orders and they had to be celibate. So Charles Dodson became the Reverend Dodson, though he never converted to full priesthood. If he had become a full priest, he may be encouraged to take on a parish and he would have found that pretty daunting. Uh, he had a speech impediment, and so reading a service was not easy for him. His mouth would open, but the words wouldn't come out. Carol spent almost his entire adult life a bachelor don, behind the cloistered walls of Christchurch. And even though he wrote both the Alice books here, he kept his identity secret. 
he instructed the porters at Christchurch to return to sender any letters that came to Lewis Carroll. He also, though he was a very keen photographer, he didn't like being photographed himself, and that probably was because he didn't want people to recognise him in the street. He didn't want fans coming up to him. Carroll was more than a keen photographer. He was a pioneer of a new art form. He took hundreds of photographs of writers, friends, artists and celebrities. But one person stands out above all others. There is no photographic image of Alice which is not arresting, startling. Like, you know, the people who nowadays become supermodels, who the camera is in love with. It was when Lewis Carroll was working in the library at Christchurch that he first spotted Alice, playing with her sisters in the deanery next door. So this is uh, his office when he was a sub-librarian. Right. As you can see, book lines, quite impressive, yes. but even more Serious impressive. Serious leather tones, yeah. no, no, Even better than that, look, this is the view. Oh, that's a beautiful wall garden. So that is where he would almost certainly have first seen Alice. Alice Little for the very first time, because that's where the Littles lived. That's where they lived, and that's where the girls were playing. Alice's father was appointed Dean of Christ Church, which at the time was the place to go. They were a glamorous family. They had parties, they had musical evenings, they were friends with royalty. Lewis Carroll was really drawn to all three little girls initially, because they were all photogenic, charismatic, and, um, upper class. He had just got his first camera and the friendship developed really with him trying to get them to sit for photographs. As you might expect for such a meticulous man, Lewis Carroll kept very detailed diaries. And here's an interesting entry for April the 25th, 1856. He was on a visit to the deanery. The three little girls were in the garden most of the time and we became excellent friends. We tried to group them in the foreground of the picture, but they were not patient sitters. I mark this day with a white stone. And that's what Carol always does when it was a particularly special day. They became tremendous friends, all, all three girls. Even, even though Alice was obviously singled out as the special one. She was pushy, imperious, shaking her hair, he always used to say, shaking the fringe out of her face and sort of bossing everyone around. Under here is one of the original plates shot by Lewis Carroll. I'm going to be allowed to have a look, but obviously it's incredibly valuable and very delicate. Oh, and I'll put on the lights, I'll be able to see it. Oh, my goodness. This is fantastic. What I'm looking at is a negative, and here she is at around six years old. You get the sense of a rather strong personality, a self-possessed little girl. She was a beautiful child. She had an assurance that her sisters didn't, and her older sister in particular didn't like being photographed. She found it really self-conscious making, but you can imagine Alice loving it. He would go over to the deanery and entertain the children. And he would be in the nursery. The governess was probably there. And he would teach them magic tricks and um, he would read stories to them. He would go almost every day. And of course, he would have the girls to his rooms as well. Oh, he got really quite involved in their lives. And they went out on outings. It seems an almost continuous round of being with them. And then, as they got to an age where they could leave the confines of, of Christchurch, he organised boat trips. And so began one of the most famous boat trips in literary history, as Carol and his friend Robinson Duckworth took Alice, Edith and Lorena Little up the River Thames to Godstow. Hi. <laughs> Hi, Martha. Hi, Mark. Hi, Mark. Good to uh, see you. This is uh, Tom, who's going to... Hi, Tom. You're, do you're all doing all the hard work, aren't you? That's it. Well, I'm very much looking forward to retracing the steps. And this is, is this the same boatyard? Uh, it is, yeah. It's the same, same family-run uh, company. Here we go. 
Well, I've managed the first stage. I haven't fallen in. Well, indeed. <laughs> that, uh, you're setting a very good precedent. It wasn't the first time that Carol told them stories, by any means, but uh, the crucial difference that day was that Alice, for whatever reason, pleaded with him to write the stories down. Alice asked him, tell me a story, tell me a story. And he would lean on his oars and go, no, not this time, next time. And the girls would say, it is next time now, tell me a story. So he unwillingly began on the story of Alice in Wonderland. He clearly was making it up as he went along. He had no notes, he hadn't planned it. He just started the story of Alice following a white rabbit down a rabbit hole. And we have her own account, don't we, of what happened that day here in, in the first biography of Lewis Carroll. And she says, um, I believe the story of Alice was told one summer afternoon when the sun was so burning that we'd landed in the meadows down the river, deserting the boat to take refuge in the only bit of shade to be found, which was under a new-made hayrick. The story Carol told them wasn't all make-believe. It was also full of in-jokes and references to real places like this, the famous treacle well not far from the river. Uh, so it's a real it place. Is. Well, exactly. is a real place. Exactly. Yeah. Here it is. Yeah. Yeah. They must have loved it because this is, it's a scene, isn't it, from the Mad Tea Party? Mm. And when he says, "Once upon a time, there were three little girls," this is the Dormouse, <laughs> and their names were Elsie, Lacey, and Tilly, and they lived at the bottom of the well. That's code, isn't it? Indeed. Lacey is an anagram for Alice herself. Uh, Elsie, if you break that to the two capital letters, L-C, you get Lorena Charlotte. The uh, older sister. The older, exactly. And then Tilly was the, the family nickname for the younger daughter, uh, Edith. So all three of them are there. The journey ended four miles upstream with a picnic on the river bank at Godstow. Alice was beginning to get very tired of sitting by her sister on the bank. Precisely, yep. And here we are on the bank. Yep, yep. yep. Um, and, and I think, you know, the reality of that day is reflected probably in that first line. Uh, and even what happens next, you know, the, Alice seeing the rabbit, the white rabbit, go down the rabbit hole and then following, you know, there are still rabbits to be seen on this part of the uh, Thames bank. Here, we have Lewis Carroll's own account of that famous golden afternoon on July 4th, 1862. Duckworth and I made an expedition up the river to Godstow with the Three Liddles. Now, on the other page, he writes later and he says, on which occasion I told them the fairy tale of Alice's adventures underground, which I undertook to write out for Alice. She was the one who nagged him to tell the story. So in that sense, she was the crucial one. It took him, I think, a year or so, but eventually he did write it down for her and he presented it to her as a Christmas present. He had written it out by hand himself and then drawn all the pictures. And this is it, the original version of the children's masterpiece, Alice's Adventures Underground. And just look at the detail in this. I mean, it's like an illuminated manuscript. It's so lovingly done. Over here, we have the large Alice. She's grown so big. And next to her, the white rabbit. And I think it's intriguing the way that Lewis Carroll has drawn this picture himself, because it's almost like the white rabbit is a kind of suitor to the much bigger, the more formidable Alice. And he's ended it with a photograph, which he's taken of Alice in the very last page. But in fact, what was discovered later on, underneath that, there's a drawing that he made himself. In keeping with his obsessive perfectionism, there are no mistakes in this manuscript. No crossings out, no blotches. Carol practiced his layout and his drawings in advance. Here you've got um, a real rabbit that he drew from um, a naturalist handbook. Um, as he develops it, it gradually metamorphoses into a fairy tale rabbit. But with a rather sad face, he's hunched over, something kind of mournful characteristic. 
What do we have here? So this is so, the number of faces. So, so this is Carol's version of Alice. Um, you know, she's looking slightly dreamy, slightly distracted, slightly distant. Yeah, slightly plaintive here. Almost all the characters seem to be slightly mournful. Um, and that might just be he's not very good as an artist, uh, or it might be that there's something about Wonderland in which the characters seem to be trapped there, as if for them it's like an open prison, because it's Alice's adventures in Wonderland. They're just there as extras. Mm. After encouragement from friends and making the most of his connections to the publisher Alexander Macmillan, Carol decided that Alice should go into print. He'd already been thinking of a new name for his book. I love this bit. He's playing around with which title to have. Alice's Hour in Elfland, question mark. The masterpiece could have been called that. And then he has Alice's Adventures in Wonderland, question mark. Alice's Adventures in Wonderland was published in 1865. The timing couldn't have been better. David Copperfield, Great Expectations, The Water Babies, all published in the same era. This is the moment when Victorian literature finds the child. So the child is becoming really into focus, which is the moment where Carol produces this astonishing dream book. And here it is, the final published version of Alice's Adventures in Wonderland. You can just see the amount of trouble that Lewis Carroll has taken in his whole involvement in this book. For example, the colour. Here, this is The Water Babies, also published by Macmillan, but in a fairly standard dark green cover. Lewis Carroll was adamant that he wanted red. Red was the colour that was going to appeal to children. But what's particularly interesting is the fact that there are stories in here the aren't in his original manuscript, the gift that he made to Alice Little. So the most famous episode of all, really, the Mad Tea Party, that wasn't in the original version, but it is here. And best of all, we have illustrations by John Tenniel. He was the famous punch illustrator who Lewis Carroll persuaded to illustrate his book. We mustn't underestimate the importance of Tenniel in the success of these books. They are sensationally good illustrations. And he was very particular, and he sent them back again and again. I think Tenniel must have got a bit fed up with him at the end. And the other thing is, they're in the middle of a lot of text. Like this, this one, for example, the story flows around the illustration. It does make a huge difference to have the illustrations as part of the, part of the page rather than a separate little page on their own. And then something which must have seemed so innovative at the time is that famous bit of the story, which is the, the mouse's tail. And here we have the original copper plates that were used to print the drawings. So you can see the difficulty the typesetter must have had in getting it going right down the page, just like a mouse's tail. And here's the, the plate with the Cheshire Cat illustration. And you can really see the kind of detail that John Tenniel used in order to produce one of the most famous images from Alice. Alice, the first female lead in children's literature and the most memorable. She's very self-confident, isn't she? She's wonderfully untroubled by the bizarre circumstances in which she finds herself. Alice is the voice of common sense. If you had a crazy character as the protagonist in a, in a crazy world, wh wh where's the difference? Where's the story? She's quite feisty, she's quite funny. She challenges the creatures she all the time. She challenges, and, and also, and, and she challenges everything that she's expected to obey in real life. In some other way, she keeps her composure, and that makes her a very unusual heroine. What other child heroine from the 19th century is like that? Mm, Jane Eyre? Not, not many. It's hard to appreciate just how revolutionary a book 
Alice in Wonderland was. Completely. This is an example of the sort of thing that was popular before. This is the history of the Fairchild family. No pictures. There are some conversations, but mostly of the finger-wagging variety. Um, and there's one episode near the beginning which, which is notorious. The father notices the children have been quarrelling. And to show them they shouldn't quarrel, what does he do? Take their toys away? No. Send them to bed without any supper? No. He takes them to a gallows to see an executed criminal who's rotting in his chains. Well, one of the things that I really like about Carol's book is the way that it's rather subversive Absolutely. about those sort of preachy books. And there's Absolutely. a fantastic bit here where um, Alice is trying to decide whether to drink that famous bottle. Yeah. And she says um, she wanted to see whether it's about poison or not, for she had read several nice little histories about children who got burned and eaten up by wild mm. beasts and many other unpleasant things, all because they would not remember the simple rules their friends had taught them, such as a red hot poker will burn you if you touch exactly. it. You know? yeah. And yet she goes ahead and drinks it anyway. Yes. You know. <laughs> she's a, yeah, she's a rebel. She is a rebel. The irony, of course, is that this rebel was created by a man who positively embraced order. It's the mark of someone who loves rules and he loves smashing them up. The croquet game breaks all the rules. The hoops move, the mallets are flamingos. The caucus race would be another example. All have won and all shall have prizes. And somebody that rule bound seems to be very excited about when the rules can be broken. I think it's very interesting the original circumstances in which he started telling the story. I mean, in the boat, going up the river. Carroll wasn't the only person rowing. His academic colleague from Trinity College, Robinson Duckworth, was rowing stroke. So he had to speak to Robinson Duckworth as well as to Lorena and Alice and Edith. And therefore, a lot of the jokes appeal to a fellow academic. You know what I mean? They're jokes about philosophy and logic and mathematics. There's some wonderful pieces of logic in this book. But I don't want to go among mad people, Alice remarked. Oh, you can't help that, said the cat. We're all mad here. I'm mad, you're mad. How do you know I'm mad, said Alice? You must be, said the cat, or you wouldn't have come here. The other thing is, it's pretty frightening. It's a strange, almost nightmarish world. I remember Alice growing her neck very tall really freaked me out, because they are freaky. That terror that you have of falling down a hole and you don't know whether you're ever going to reach the bottom of it, that's something that is very, very strong in a child's memory. Alice's encounters with the weird creatures of Wonderland are actually a much more literal account of what adults look like to children than we, as adults, like to think. And the fact that they, they shout things you don't understand, like, you know, uh, off with his head, which isn't that different to go to your bed. I think it was Virginia Woolf who said that Peril could remember much more vividly what childhood felt like than most of us can once we've ceased to be children. So are there clues in Carol's own childhood that help us to understand this special empathy with children? He was born near Warrington in 1832. His father was a clergyman in the village of Darsbury. Carol was the eldest son and he was surrounded by, well, by little girls. Uh, there were two brothers, but lots and lots of sisters. When Carol was 11, the family moved to a large rectory near Darlington. He kept his siblings entertained with homemade magazines full of stories and cartoons. He became their leader and entertainer. He had a natural talent in storytelling. Over a hundred years later, an amazing discovery was found under the floorboards of what was then the nursery. We have a little handkerchief. Oh, how lovely. Oh, this is um, a letter from his mother. That is um, his mother's handwriting, so he's kept that. Yeah. And I suppose that's one of the real clues to show that this really did belong exactly. to the Dodson yes. family. Yes. yes. And that's a little teapot lid. Well, a teapot lid, of yes. course. Yes. yes. Mad Hatter's tea party. Yes. And then we have a white glove. A white oh, glove. Wow. Just like the glove. Not which the poor white rabbit kept losing, didn't he, during the story? Yes. I know. 
We don't know exactly when these treasures were planted or by whom. But whenever it was, it's as though Carol was telling us something not just about Alice's adventures in Wonderland, but also about himself. By the time he arrived at Christchurch, he may have left his childhood behind, but he carried the idea of it with him and from then on children and child friends would remain at the centre of his life. Well, he's supposed to have said that they were three quarters of his life. And I do think they were very important to him. And I think he saw them partly as a sort of refuge against the, from the adult world. When Carol wrote to his child friends, he wrote as one of them. His letters are mini works of art, like this letter with pictures instead of words. Or this one, written in the shape of a spiral. Or this, where he's pretending to be afraid. This was a man who came alive in a different sense with children. But what exactly was going on with Carol's relationship with children? And what was the nature of the relationship with Alice Liddell? Despite the wonder of his books, these are the questions that always hang over Carol. And this is where the arguments begin amongst Carol experts. He once asked Alice for a lock of her hair. Was that a lover's token? Today, we may well think that a lock of hair is a love token. I mean, what did it mean then? I mean, she was just a young girl. So I think it's really, it's very difficult to describe. I mean, it's the, the character of the man is one that enjoyed the friendship of children, but there is no sense of a, a love interest in this at all. He was emotionally involved. There's just no question about that. And that's why um, I can't bear these critics who say that he was, he only had a paternal interest in the girls. Uh, that won't do. <laughs> I think he was in love with her. Um, but I don't think he would have admitted that to himself. What makes Alice in Wonderland I would argue such a powerful book is the very fact of Carol's repressed uh, attraction to, to, to Alice. Among the photographs Carol took of Alice in the deanery garden is this one, still controversial to this day. It shows Alice dressed as a beggar maid with her ragged dress falling off her shoulder. It's quite a challenging look, isn't it? It's a very challenging look. Uh, and the fact that you can just see one of her nipples is something that a lot of viewers find slightly disturbing, as if there is a little, little flash of sexuality there. It looks a little as if it's a kind of come on gesture, but um, the fact that she's holding her hand to her body is because in photography, if she was outstretched, that would shake and that would blur the picture, no other reason. Would it have been as disturbing to a Victorian audience? No, uh, um, taking photographs of middle-class children dressed up, this was an absolutely standard piece of acting out, but it's the most famous one because, as you say, the gaze pins us and we don't know how to read her. The picture may be ambiguous, but one thing is certain, the special friendship between Carol and Alice Little resulted in one of the greatest children's books ever written. And yet, by the time Alice's Adventures in Wonderland was published, that friendship had come to an abrupt end. Why? A year or so after the boat trip to Godstow, in June 1863, something happened uh, and uh, Luce Carroll was exiled from the deanery. To find out what happened, the obvious place to come would be here to his diaries. But when you look inside, pages are missing. 
just looking along here, you can see where there's been a razor cut. When his nieces inherited his diaries, they cut out a number of pages. And we have to put bits and pieces together to try to think of what might have happened in the deanery. For five months following this apparent rift, there's no mention of the little girls in the diaries at all, until we come to December the 5th and there's a theatrical evening. At the very end of that day, Lewis Carroll writes, Mrs. Little and the children were there, but I held aloof from them as I have been all this term. Held aloof, such an interesting phrase. What was really going on? It's my theory that Alice's mother was the cause of the split. Carol's manner grew too affectionate to Alice. Alice's mother was a dreadful snob. She was known as the Kingfisher in Oxford, and she wanted kings, princes, earls, dukes for her daughters. So she stamped on it, and she burnt um, all the letters that Alice had received from Dodgham um, in the waste paper basket in the deanery. Is there evidence of that? My grandfather mentions that it happened, yep. It's a story in my family. So was Carol's attachment to Alice the cause of the rift? It's possible, but there may be other explanations. In this archive in Woking, where the Carroll family papers are kept, an intriguing piece of evidence, a scrap of paper, points in two other directions. Alice's sister Lorena, or Ina as she was known, and the governess, Mary Prickett. This is a note written by the niece who cut out the pages. It's actually called Cut Pages in Diary. She writes, L.C. Lewis Carroll learns from Mrs. Little that he's supposed to be using the children as a means of paying court to the governess. He's also supposed to be courting Ina, that's Alice's older sister. So what this suggests is that the rift wasn't anything to do with his relationship with Alice, but in fact was about the governess or her sister. It's true that there were rumours at the time about Carol and Lorena, and also about the governess, and that's what this scrap of paper is referring to. However, there is another document, a letter written by Lorena to Alice when they were both in their 80s. In it, Lorena informs Alice that she's just been interviewed by a biographer, and she's worried about the explanation she's given for the rift. I said his manner became too affectionate to you as you grew older, and that Mother spoke to him about it, and that offended him, so he ceased coming to visit us again, as one had to give some reason for all intercourse ceasing. This letter appears to point things back to Alice, although it can be read two ways. But we don't know which word we're supposed to stress. Is it... I said his manner became too affectionate to you. In other words, he behaved badly. He maybe tried to kiss her. Or is it, I said his manner became too affectionate to you because actually it was me that he was after and I had to give some excuse to throw her off the scent. Again, we simply don't know. But why would it have been worse for him to be affectionate towards Lorena than to Alice? Irina was the eldest daughter. She was above the age of consent. The age of consent was 12. So for Carol to kiss her would have meant something different in everyone's eyes than him kissing a very little girl like Alice. Because to us, it seems so much worse, the suggestion that mother had banned Carol yeah. from the house for being too affectionate towards a little girl. Yeah, exactly. It's tempting, of course, to think of Carol as a you know, Victorian Jimmy Savile, but in fact, we have dozens and dozens and dozens of records from girls who he befriended, who made it clear that there was a kind of ritual to their friendship. It involved kissing them chastely, and that was it. But for him, it was almost a way of proving that his intentions were pure. Or possibly as a very repressed man, this was as far as he felt he could safely go. We have various bits of evidence which can be twisted and turned and shaped in different ways, 
But ultimately, it comes down to this, what do we think was going on inside his head. So the mystery of the rift remains unsolved. All we know for sure is that in June 1863, Carol was exiled from the deanery. And when he was eventually invited back in December that year, his relationship with the family had become formal and distant. He was asked back for tea, but then everything changed. Everything changed. They grew apart. There's a rather sad last final picture he took of her. She looks sad and the mood is sad. She looks rather wistful in a way there. I think it mirrors the portrait that Carol, the last one that he took of her. I think, um, I think she looks sad. I mean, her beloved sister Edith had died by then. I think you can see that etched into her face because it's the kind of wonderful brio that she had as a little girl. That's true, yeah. Has yeah. gone, hasn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah. Alice had grown up. On the surface, she'd forgotten Carol, her childhood friend. She married a man called Reginald Hargreaves, but chose a revealing name for one of her sons. Well, she gave my grandfather the name of Carol, which uh, she always denied, incredibly, had any resonance at all, but you can't help think, come on. For Carol, the real Alice may have left his life, but the fictional Alice lived on. He couldn't stop recreating her. First, in the famous sequel, Through the Looking Glass and What Alice Found There. Then in merchandise and spin-offs. For him, it's not about the money. It's more about trying to maintain contact with his dream child. But part of it also, I think, goes back to his own childhood, being safe in this little paradise. She was a strange, distorted version of him. So little Alice will never grow up. And even though Carol himself had, it meant he could always go back to it again and again. It's as if he wanted to be that ideal dream child. Did he simply want to be her? Or was there something else as well? Over his lifetime, Carol accumulated hundreds of child friends. He'd meet them on railway journeys and at the seaside, his pockets brimming with puzzles and games. He basically picks them up. He picks them up in trains, he picks them up at friends' houses, and of course they're not alone, they're always accompanied by their parents, their nurses, their governesses. That kind of collecting of children um, became a, 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 an astonishing way of life. What was really going on? Who knows? Uh, it certainly would raise eyebrows these days from social services and parents, uh, and it did raise some eyebrows then. Well, I think people are quite often very quick to criticise, thinking about things as they are in this day and age. Um, I think one always has to put oneself back to the period in which these events took place. And, um, I mean, there is absolutely no evidence whatsoever that, you know, things were improper or anything like that. Was there ever any complaints about his behaviour towards children, either from the children themselves or their parents? I don't know of any at all. And I studied this man for over 40 years. So I think if there had been any, I would have found them by now. The interesting thing here is that his first biographer, Dodge and Collingwood, he does seem to have distorted the record in order to suggest that the child friends were younger than they actually were. Because when he was writing this biography at the end of the 19th century, it seemed fine for a bachelor to spend his time with little girls, but very questionable for him to spend his time with sexually adult young women. And so he slightly twisted the evidence to make them younger. Uh, with very odd consequences, of course, for Carol's subsequent reputation, since we now take precisely the opposite view. The picture, though, gets complicated, because Carol not only collected children, 
He photographed them in his studio. And in some of those images, the children are naked. To modernise, this certainly seems questionable. This is an interesting one. Because if you think about Alice going up the river for the story to be told, you know, going to Wonderland through the riverbank, here you've got another girl who is naked on the riverbank. But it's not just a photograph. What he's done is he's taken a photograph of her and then he sent it away to an artist to be professionally hand-coloured and a whole background has been painted in. And what it's done is it's turned her into a little Eve before the fall. It stops it being a photograph of a naked girl and it turns it into an artistic nude. He did have a sort of obsession with innocence and childhood and innocence. And these days, we would not have considered it possible for a photographer to photograph young children in the nude. It would be absolutely inconceivable. You know, they'd be bundled off to prison as quick as you... But in those days, um, he, he could do that. And it was sort of, yes, that's all right. He's, a, he's an artist, he's a photographer, and the children are perfectly innocent. And there's no, nothing wrong going on at all. And there wasn't, actually, probably. I think Carol thought of childhood as innocent, like many people, he thought the human body was a supremely beautiful thing, and he thought the most supremely beautiful form of human body was the female body before puberty. That is quite disturbing. It is. Isn't and, and it? That's, a, that's a little girl in a very adult pose. Either you could think of this as the little girl who, whose body naturally and unselfconsciously falls into this kind of posture. Or it could be putting a little girl in an overtly sexual pose. Well, this is, this is the problem we've got, isn't it? That all we've got is the image. Dodson himself, uh, I think, was a heavily repressed paedophile, okay. without doubt. Many of the suggestions about his relationship with children being unhealthy is totally unfounded and, in my view, totally false. There are many people who misunderstand Lewis Carroll because they haven't done their homework. There are people who will strongly contest that, won't they? They'll say, actually, what he was interested in was the innocence of childhood, which was almost like a cult in Victorian times. I think that's what paedophiles are interested in, is the, the, the uh, apparent innocence of children. It's a problem, isn't it? It's a problem when somebody writes a great book and they're not a great person. These days, naked photographs of children are really not acceptable in our own culture. I think it's, it was different in those days because there are so many Victorian pictures showing naked children. I mean, if you look at Julia Margaret Cameron, for example, who was his contemporary, she had pictures of naked children. So what are we to make of Lewis Carroll's relationship with his child friends, and in particular, the nude photographs? I'll be honest, I'm such a big fan of his work that I'm quite resistant to the idea of exploring any possible dark side. And it's certainly true that in the Victorian period, images of naked children were more widespread. But there's no doubt that some of the images are really quite disturbing. So are we imposing the sensibility of the 21st century back into the Victorian era, or simply trying to protect an author whose work we love? Carol's photographs of young naked children are undoubtedly controversial. But towards the very end of filming, and after completing our interviews with the Carol experts in this programme, we stumbled across this. If authentic, it would completely change our ideas about Carol. Our researcher found this photograph in a French museum. It's attributed to Lewis Carroll, and it's labelled Lorena Little. Now, Carol took lots of photographs of Lorena, but this one is shockingly different. It's a full frontal picture of a naked young teenager, a picture which no parent would ever have consented to. So is it genuine? Well, here are some photographs we know Carol took of Lorena at Christchurch. Is this the same girl? 
whoever the young girl is, she certainly doesn't look at ease. So was this taken by Lewis Carroll? It certainly needs investigating. I didn't really expect that my adventures in search of Lewis Carroll would take me through a door marked French Riviera. And look, there may be no real way of discovering who took this photograph, or even if it really is of Lorena Little. But the image isn't allowed out of the country, so coming here to Marseille and subjecting it to expert tests may be the best way of discovering more clues. This isn't the first time the image has been examined. In 1993, the Carroll expert Edward Wakeling judged it to be inauthentic when he compared it to known Carroll photographs. But would subjecting the original to forensic tests suggest something different? Nicholas Burnett is a picture conservationist with specialist knowledge of 19th century photography. There is something quite strange, isn't it, about the pair of us looking back into the eyes of this girl. And it's a young girl, isn't it? A naked picture of a young girl. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. We've brought Nicholas here to the Musée Cantini in Marseille to examine the photograph. It says, Lorena Little, mm -hmm. L. Carroll, Cole, M. C. So I think, I think that's um, a dealer's inscription saying what it is and where it came from, coal probably is short for collection. The Musée Cantini don't use the letters MC on their photographs, so we don't know what MC stands for. We do know that the photograph used to be held by the gallery Texbrawn in Paris. After the death of the owners in 1986, it was donated here. But is it dated from the early 1860s when Carol was photographing the little girls? There's a lot of damage on the surface. There's a big crease up here. Corner's been torn off. There's some scratches. You can see the little brown spots on her face. It's a very slow growing mold. Very difficult to uh, fake convincingly. Um, it looks like it's got a very thin albumin coating. Uh, albumin, of course, is egg white. So let's have a little peek there. Yep, that's very thin. That's what you'd expect from the 1850s, 1860s. So we can rule out a modern fake. So we've established that the photograph was taken around the same time that Carol was seeing the Littles. What about the kind of camera being used for this? Well, he used um, an Otto Wills folding camera. It's the sort of camera that it would have been taken with. Two wooden boxes, one slightly smaller than the other, just sliding into each other. But was the photograph developed using the same method that Carol used. This was called the wet collodion process, in which chemicals are poured over a glass negative. A little bit earlier than this, it would have been from a paper negative, and then it wouldn't have been quite so crisp. This uh, print has been printed from a wet collodion negative. So can you just, given what you've been looking at so far, can you sum up for us what we know and what we don't know about this photograph? Well, it's taken using a negative process that Carol used. It's printed on the sort of paper that he used about the right date, so, so far everything, everything fits. We have an inscription on the old mount saying Lorena Little and L. Carroll, but is there anything on the back of the print itself? The way to find out is by thinning down the corners. Carroll began using his studio in 1863. He typically numbered his pictures, although some of the records for the early 1860s are missing. One would expect each print to be numbered, but this print has been cropped. The negative is larger than the photograph, right. so it's possible that it was there and it's been snipped off. It doesn't look like there's anything there. What does that mean, do you think? But the absence of one doesn't really prove anything because, as I say, it might have been trimmed off. Overall, we've put this photograph through a number of different tests mm. and you've given us your scientific opinion about it all. What's your gut instinct? My gut instinct is it's by Lewis Carroll. Yeah. Why is that? Just everything about it, really. 
You know, that was so interesting because I'd half expected our expert to say, no, this couldn't possibly have been taken by Lewis Carroll. It was from the wrong period or was actually an out and out fake. But in fact, even though we didn't find an inscription by Lewis Carroll himself, we now know that it was developed using the same process as Carroll would have been used, a similar camera, and actually that it dates from the period when Lorena Little herself would have been a young teenager. Back in London, I'm on my way to see forensic imagery analyst David Anley. He works as an expert witness in court cases, and he's going to compare the characteristics in known photographs of Lorena at different ages with the photograph that we found. If we start with the eyebrows, now the image at the top here is of the older Lorena as an adult. The image in the middle is the younger Lorena, and the one at the bottom is the girl in your photograph. There are certain similarities. The line of the eyebrows is consistent, and there is a further consistency in their depth at various points. If we then go on to the eyes, you can see that there is a fairly hooded appearance. And this feature appears consistent both with the girl in the photograph and of Lorena. If we look at the nose, again, in terms of the width of the nose at the nasion, here the point between the eyes, the bridge, and uh, the width of the ailey, the fleshy pads on the side of the nose there, those are all broadly consistent, as is the apparent form of the nostrils. To my inexpert eye, they do look remarkably similar. They, they are similar, and there are certainly no indications there of a significant difference. And then the upper and lower lips. These to me are most interesting of the features that we see here. All three images appear to show a cupid's bow in the upper lip, but most interestingly, the lower lip is fairly prominent and protruding in the centre and on the right-hand side, but over on the left it fades away. And that's evident here in the girl on the photograph, here on the younger Lorena, and still evident to a degree here in the older Lorena. Overall, what are you able to tell us about this photograph? Well, if I was doing a, a comparison such as this for a court case, I would say, forensically speaking, we would say that there is moderate support for the contention that the girl in the photograph is Lorena, as shown in the other images. Uh, as this is not for a court case, I'm prepared to get off the fence a little bit and say that, uh, in my opinion, I, I would say it's her. We can't say for certain that this is a photograph of Lorena Little, but we have established that it's not a fake, it's a genuine photograph, and it's from the exact period when Lorena Little herself would have been a young teenager. If true, this casts a further troubling light on the life of Lewis Carroll, and also offers a possible explanation for that mysterious rift between him and the Little family. So this is where our investigations have taken us. Now, of course, we've got no provenance directly linking Carol with this photograph. But why would someone bother to label it as Lorena Little? She was a pretty obscure figure at the time. The questions which hang over this photograph mirror the larger controversies about Lewis Carroll's life, ideas which are strongly resisted by his many admirers, who say that we're trying to impose modern values on a very different age. Perhaps we'll never find out the real truth about Lewis Carroll, however much we delve. But as we come to celebrate the 150th anniversary of this book, we can marvel at the way this pedantic, cloistered mathematics don has managed to capture the imagination of children throughout the world. The man, however flawed, has written a work of genius that's been rediscovered generation after generation. In a new series of A Good Read, Maureen Lipman and Frankie Boyle talk about their favourite books. That's Tuesday afternoon at 4.30 on Radio 4. A powerful coming-of-age tale about a pair of teenage girls here on BBC Two tonight. Ginger and Rosa is our film later at 10.30. That's after a selection of QI moments worth watching again. Next.